Hey YouTube, I'm Ross Stewart with Stewart Media Digital, and if you follow my channel, you may know I recently got my hands on this Sigma 35mm f1.2 lens. Now that 1.2 maximum aperture is really exciting to me, and I made a hands-on review where I used this lens out in the real world taking portraits, and I also did an in-depth review to really get into the nitty gritty. But since I already own the Sony Zeiss 35mm 1.4, I wanted to compare the two and see which lens is the right lens for you. These lenses are both really high quality professional lenses that are similarly priced with the Sigma being $1,500 US and the Sony Zeiss being $1,600. So let's dive in and take a look at the image quality, the sharpness, the bokeh, vignetting, distortion, as well as the build quality and the autofocus of these two lenses to see which is the right lens for you. So here we are in Lightroom to take a look at the sharpness, the bokeh quality, as well as the vignetting and distortion. First up, we have the Sigma 1.2 at 1.2, so wide open. And immediately the image looks really nice to me. It looks really sharp here in the center and the bokeh is really pleasing. It looks soft, it looks smooth. There is a good amount of cat eye around the edges, but that's really to be expected. Uh, so now let's punch in and take a look at the sharpness. I focused right around here. So let's go two to one. And by the way, this was shot on my Sony a7R 3 which is their 42.4 megapixel camera. I wanted as much resolution as I could get to really evaluate this sharpness. So being able to see this much detail in the threads at 1.2 is honestly pretty impressive to me. Uh, so far, this lens is looking nice and sharp. And as we move away from this area where I focused, uh, this is only millimeters further back, but you can see it is already starting to fall off. So that depth of field at 1.2 is going to be really shallow. And at first I thought that maybe this was uh, a lack of sharpness as you move away from the center of the frame. But if you punch in over here towards the edge, the texture and the detail of the table at the edge of the frame on this really shallow uh, strip right here, really shallow depth of field, it's still really good. Uh, it does seem to be quite a bit sharper in the center, but really that is not too bad at all. And by the way, all profile corrections are turned off for all images in this video. Uh, so now let's compare it to the Sony Zeiss wide open, which is 1.4. So it's going to be uh, a little bit narrower of an aperture, but still wide open. So here's the Sony Zeiss. And the first thing I notice is that the Sigma, going back to the Sigma, now back to the Sony Zeiss, is the Sigma seemed to bulge quite a bit in the middle. This is a little bit closer to what I see in real life, but the Sony Zeiss may even have a little bit of uh, pin cushion distortion versus the Sigma's definitely bulges in the middle quite a bit. So the Sigma has quite a bit of barrel distortion. Uh, but let's go back now back to the Sony Zeiss and talk about the sharpness and the bokeh. The first thing I noticed about the bokeh is that it is still really nice, but we get a ton of this, let's punch in, this onion bokeh where it kind of looks like the layers of an onion. And there is quite a bit of fringing. There's this hard green edge around the bokeh uh, really, it's still really nice bokeh though. It's definitely not something to complain over, but the Sigmas did seem to be quite a bit nicer. Now let's punch in. I focused on the same area here and the detail in the thread is also really nice. It is hard to say which one is sharper. Uh, I think let's flip back to the uh, Sigma, go over to the same area. So Sigma wide open uh, versus Sony wide open. And you can see the framing even seems a little bit different because of that bulge. This is the, uh, the Sigma. Um, the bulge from the barrel distortion gives you a slightly different uh, framing here when you punch in. 
um, but both seem really sharp. This is almost a wash. I could go in even closer and do some serious pixel peeping, but they both look really sharp wide open. Definitely impressed by both of them. So now let's punch out. Let's go back to the Sigma. So here's the Sigma wide open at 1.2, and I, throughout all of these shots, I balanced the exposure to get the same total light gathered. So as I, uh, as I closed the aperture down, I also increased the shutter speed. So this should be the same overall exposure, but when I go from f1.2 on the Sigma to f1.4, at 1.4 it seems a little bit brighter. So this leads me to believe that f1.4 is as much light as you're going to let in using the uh, using the aperture, which is pretty common. There's only a certain amount of surface area of light that the aperture can transmit onto the sensor. So even as you start to get these wildly uh, wide open apertures that doesn't always necessarily translate into more light. It will give you more bokeh and it will give you a shallower depth of field, but there's, it, there is a limit to how much more light it can let in. So these should be balanced, but if we go back to the 1.2 versus 1.4 with the shutter speed adjusted appropriately to compensate, the 1.4 does look brighter. So I think 1.4 is the most low light performance you're gonna get out of this lens. But now let's just, let's flip back and forth between 1.2 and 1.4. The bokeh immediately gets a little bit rounder at 1.4 and that's really nice to see. Let's punch in and take a look at the sharpness. So here's the sharpness at 1.4 versus 1.2. Already just that third of a stop it is sharper, it is noticeably sharper. So I think that this is going to be a great versatile lens that you could do product photography with, you could do a lot of different stuff depending on your needs. You don't always have to shoot at 1.2. Let's compare this 1.4 to the Sony Zeiss's 1.4 since that is as wide as that lens can go. So again, here's the Sigma and here's the Sony Zeiss. Uh, looking at this, the Sigma is sharper at 1.4, and it's noticeable. Uh, they were about the same wide open, but both at 1.4, which is wide open for the Sony, but not for the Sigma, it is sharper. So that's honestly surprising and pretty cool to see out of a Sigma. Uh, Sigma, of course, has been making great stuff for a while now, but Sony Zeiss, Zeiss has a lot of uh, power behind that name. So. A little bit surprised to see the Sigma outshine it in this particular category. Now let's compare them at f2.8, which is what in all of my testing I found was the peak sharpness for both of these lenses. So first let's take a look at the Sigma at 2.8. And the first thing I notice is that the bokeh gets a lot uglier. It is quite a bit rounder, it got rid of the cat eye, but you can start to see, it does have an 11 rounded blade aperture, but now with the Sigma, we are getting a lot of this onion look. It almost looks like uh, cells dividing, if you remember uh, biology class. It's, uh, it's less attractive. It's still nice. Uh, bokeh is bokeh, nice bokeh is uh, nice bokeh, um, but it is, let's go back to the 1.2. Here it is wide open, here it is at 2.8. Um, I, I still think it's great, but definitely better wide open. Now still at 2.8 on the Sigma, let's punch in and that is sharp. That is really sharp. Um, the, the depth of field is still pretty shallow. Of course, 2.8, of course, it's still gonna be pretty shallow, uh, but it does fall off pretty quickly. Um, again, we are two to one. So when you zoom out, the whole wallet looks pretty sharp. Uh, but when you punch in, and you can also see here on the table the difference in the uh, in the depth of field between 1.2, it's 
very razor thin, and then at 2.8, we get quite a bit more depth of field. So now let's compare it to the Sony Zeiss. Uh, this bokeh also somehow gets quite a bit less appealing in my opinion. I don't mind the shape as much. I think the shape of the bokeh is a little bit nicer here on the Sony Zeiss, but when you punch in, uh, you get, again, it looks like cells dividing to me or something. I'm not, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a biologist, but yeah, if you remember biology class, it, this looks messy. This bokeh doesn't look nearly as pleasing. And again, with the Sony Zeiss, you have this fringing around the edge. You have a hard edge to the bokeh that you, uh, back to the Sigma, um, is, is a bit softer. But again, you do have a little bit of an edge. Uh, neither one is perfect in terms of bokeh. And uh, if you were gonna show a client either of these, I think they'd be really happy. But since we are pixel pe peeping and we are uh, comparing side by side, I do think that the Sony Zeiss is maybe a little bit nicer. Uh, I think the shape is better. This is all subjective, by the way. If you have a different opinion, feel free to let me know. Um, and then back to the Sigma. Something I noticed though is that the Sigma does have larger bo bokeh balls. Uh, so whatever that's worth, uh, it's hard to put a value judgment on that. Definitely something interesting. Let's punch in and check out that sharpness again. Uh, like I said earlier, very sharp on the Sigma and also really sharp on the Sony Zeiss. So flipping back and forth, let's get the framing more similar. Uh, and again, that barrel distortion makes the center of the image pop more on the Sigma. Uh, so it's hard to say, they're both really sharp. They're both really impressive. If I had to give it to one, I might actually give it to the Sigma. Again, the Sigma did Sigma did really well uh, making a sharp, super wide aperture lens. So now let's switch over to the vignetting. Now that we've talked about the bokeh sharpness and barrel distortion, let's just take a quick look at vignetting. So this is, the, this is just a plain textured white wall in my house. This is the Sony Zeiss. And wide open at 1.4, there is quite a bit of vignetting, uh, but it is a little bit more localized to the edges. It does creep in quite a bit, but when I switch over to the Sigma wide open, it seems to come closer in towards the middle. It's not quite as dark at, at, at the edges, but it goes in quite a bit further, whereas I feel like the uh, Sony Zeiss is a little bit more of a smooth transition and it doesn't stay quite as dark for quite as long as you move towards the center. So that was wide open for both of them. Here's the Sigma at 1.2 and the Sony Zeiss at 1.4. Uh, now let's compare them at f2. So that's one full stop uh, down on the uh, Sony Zeiss and a stop and a third down on the Sigma. So here's the Sony Zeiss at F2. Cleared up a lot of that vignetting between 1.4 and 1.2. A lot of vignetting is taken care of, but it's still pretty noticeable. Here's F2 on the Sigma. And that cleared up even more. The Sigma seems to uh, clear up some of that vignetting at a faster rate. Um, now let's compare back to the Sony Zeiss at f2.8, uh, which it's mostly gone at this point, it's still noticeable at the edges, but it seems way more consistent throughout. You can still see it's a little bit brighter here and a little darker at the edges, uh, but this is definitely a much more manageable amount of vignetting here at 2.8. And of course, just like barrel distortion, uh, this is really easy to fix in post, especially photos, especially if you shoot raw. It's a little bit trickier, but still definitely possible in video. And definitely something to be aware of if you're not looking to go through and edit all of your photos. The profile correction in Lightroom does help, but it is not perfect. So 2.8 on the Sony Zeiss and 2.8 on the Sigma. Uh, both clear up pretty well by 
Um, because 2.8 is the peak performance of both of these lenses in all of my testing, I didn't go any further than this. I'm sure they clear up even more, but this is definitely, uh, at 2.8, both become very acceptable to me. Wide open, I think the Sony Zeiss definitely wins, but not by a huge margin. So now let's talk about autofocus. First, let's take a look at the Sigma. It was really snappy, really reliable. Uh, when I used eye detect, it worked really well. It did a great job tracking the eye as it moved across the frame. And for other stills, it just moves back and forth uh, when switching the autofocus point really quickly and really reliably. The one thing I will say is that throughout the several thousand shots I took with this lens, uh, over a couple of weeks, it did give me trouble a couple of times, which is really not a big deal. Um, in some situations, I could see not having 100% reliability being a little bit of an issue, but in a few thousand shots, only having a couple minor issues, uh, it's really not bad at all. I have avoided buying third-party lenses for a while because the autofocus is sometimes not quite as good as native lenses, but Sigma did a great job here. Now the Sony Zeiss, this lens has never given me any trouble. I've owned it for a couple years and I can't think of a single time where it didn't autofocus exactly how I wanted it to. I think this lens autofocuses really well, but comparing the two, it's honestly a wash. The Sigma is maybe 95% as reliable and for most people's needs, that's not going to make a huge difference. So now let's talk about build quality. The first thing you'll notice is that the Sigma is substantially larger. It's not only larger, but it's also much heavier. The Sigma is two and a half pounds or 1,080 grams, and the Sony is 1.2 pounds or 630 grams. They're both really well built with a mostly metal construction on each one with magnesium alloy interiors. I would say that the build quality on both of these are very good. They feel very professional, very robust, and very sturdy, even though they are both quite heavy with the Sigma being very, very heavy. The focus rings on both of them are pretty good. On the Sony, it is a bit looser, uh, but it still has a good amount of resistance, and it is metal on the Sony, whereas with the Sigma, you still have a really good focus ring. Uh, it is quite a bit stiffer, it is rubberized, and the throw is definitely something worth mentioning about the Sigma. It has a really long throw. You have to turn it and turn it and turn it if you wanna go from close focus to focusing on something distant. Uh, they both have manual aperture rings, which I do really like about uh, some of these Sony lenses and the Sony third-party lenses like the Sigma. Uh, the clicks on both of them are pretty good, but on my, on my copy of the Sony Zeiss, uh, the clicks are not as stiff as I would like. They do bump out of place sometimes, whereas on the Sigma, the clicks feel really good. They're really uh, snappy and I feel confident that it is going to stay in place, not get knocked to the wrong aperture. Uh, both of them have the ability to de-click the aperture, uh, which is pretty nice for video shooters if you want those smooth transitions in, uh, in exposure while you're shooting video. I personally don't really ever use this feature, but if you do like it, it's nice to see it on both of these lenses. Uh, here's where some of the major differences in terms of build quality start to show up. The Sony does not have an autofocus manual focus switch, which I find to be really kind of annoying out of a lens that is $1,600 and is considered a professional grade lens. The Sigma, does have a, an autofocus manual focus switch, as well as an autofocus lock button, uh, which you see on some of the Sony G Master lenses. It is customizable to be just about anything. Uh, I personally don't ever use it, 
but it is nice to see it on a third-party lens. Both of these lenses claim to be weather sealed. The Sony Zeiss does not have a rubber gasket on the back, so I don't entirely trust that, but I have used it in a light drizzle without any issues whatsoever. The Sigma does have a rubber gasket, which is really nice and makes me feel a little bit more confident about its weather sealing. And finally, on the topic of build quality, both come with these nice lens hoods. The Sigma's is pretty good, but it does feel pretty cheaply made compared to the rest of the lens because the lens build quality is so good. But it does its job well and overall no complaints. The Sony, on the other hand, its lens hood is maybe the best I've ever seen. It is mostly metal with rubber on the edge, uh, and that really helps keep it from getting beat up. A lot of my other lens hoods, uh, they start to have little dings and scratches along the edge because I mostly use my lens hoods to protect the front element. So if I'm shooting an event and walking around, the lens hood might be bumping into stuff uh, to keep the glass safe, but it does end up with the dings along the edges. So this rubber is really cool to see to prevent those dings from showing up. So a lot of pros and cons to each one of these lenses. If I didn't already own one of these, I personally would choose the Sigma, but since I already own the Sony Zeiss, I don't think it's better enough to justify uh, selling my Sony and buying the Sigma. Uh, they, they are both really good lenses, and I think pretty much anybody would be happy with either one of them. Uh, hopefully this was helpful to you guys. Please be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.